Chapter 11 Mass Mind Control Truth or Fiction Perhaps since before the advent of stationary agriculture and fishing societies, men have attempted to practice various forms of mass mind control with varying levels of success. It began in a consciously planned sense in the caved ends of pre-dawn humanoids. The male who gained the leadership of the group through his hunting skills and physical strength ruled his clan through a system of fear and respect. In its basic sense, this law of rule with various ideological and technological attributes still prevails among human species. In a basic sense, this law of rule with various ideological and technical attributes still prevails among the human species even unto this day. Perhaps the hunter leader of the cave clan gradually gained a kind of mythical status because of his ability to overcome the most ferocious game and his prowess in combat against upstart males of his own clan and enemies of other clans. By keeping the tusks of the largest boar or the teeth of the bear, he seemed to mystically capture the strength and cunning of those worthy adversaries, thus gaining more overall control of the minds and destinies of his clan. Soon, just the knowledge of what he had done caused others to bend to his will, and if the game was plentiful, he could even afford to be benevolent, thus gaining a modicum of admiration and even love. As this leader grew older, and possibly because of injuries sustained, he was forced to rely more and more on his mental dexterity to remain his exalted position in the clan. Coupled with his accumulated knowledge and game habits and his tracking skills, as well as his intuitive attributes, was his grasp of the persuasive power of ritual. Today, a person who possesses this intangible touch of mysticism is said to have charisma, and such a person makes a successful politician, actor, minister, or salesman. Unfortunately, charisma, intelligence, and fairness don't always go hand in hand. Thus, a maniac as well as a saint can possess this ability to control the emotion and even destinies of masses and of believers. There have always been a few individuals who possessed charismatic leadership abilities which far exceeded those of others and who were able to gain the influence to control the minds and actions of the masses. Jesus of Nazareth accomplished this feat by exuding some great and tangible esoteric saintliness and a philosophical oratory which was and is of the highest benevolent rapport. The Prophet Muhammad also possessed a great measure of this saintliness, but the negative aspect of the justifiable murder or holy war was incorporated into his philosophy. The force of the persuasive power of both of those men exists in strong measure even today. Even so, Without a doubt, the religious connection in its many forms has been the most successful method of mass mind control to have thus far existed throughout all of recorded history. But we would do well to understand that religion itself serves only as a catalyst or rallying point of the control, and the driving force of the mass compliance stems from base, raw, and uncomplicated compulsions that lay in the hearts of humankind. When a Christian went to war, all non-Christians were branded heathens and barbarians and were subhumans, deserving only conversion or death. When the Muslim went to war, all non-Muslims were labeled infidels and pagans and were thus deserving only of conversion, slavery, or death. Even with this success ratio and mass mind control of the minds of great populaces, the most astute among the perpetrators knew that religion itself was not the basic driving force and that a large segment used religion's percepts only as a catalyst of opportunity towards other ends. In other words, there are Muslims who drink and gamble and indulge in all other vices surreptitiously, and Christians who only pay lip service to the doctrines of their faith. 
So in the real sense, true mass mind control has never been a reality. For a time, the mass population control was accomplished by the Khmer Rouge of Pol Pot, who murdered millions in Cambodia in the post-Vietnam era. Without a doubt, the mass control accomplished by the Khmer Rouge was born entirely of fear and terror. The hearts and minds of the Cambodian masses were never won over. They simply complied with Pol Pot's orders to avoid being summarily murdered. The most heartless and ruthless among the Khmer killers were often young boys and girls. Here we see the expression of the base of raw and beastly elements of the human animal in action. The Khmer Rouge never masqueraded under any religious ideology. In their enforced isolation, they swiftly evolved a totally separate and vengeful mentality toward all of the surrounding populace, and they succeeded in attaining and holding a mental state of total enemy to all non camera so that when their time finally came, they were able to slaughter their fellow beings without qualm or remorse. In the case of the Khmer, their wrath was not born of religious or even coherent political ideological percept, but of an unbridled vengeance upon those whom they have come to perceive as their lifelong persecutors. Even though many of the younger Khmer had never come into close contact with or been involved in a military action against the soft ones of the cities. Unlike many other conquerors, the Khmer did not gain their position through the popular support of the people, but because of the lack of any organized resistance on the part of the ruling factions of the country. Before the rise of the Khmer Rouge, the political situation in the country had deteriorated through graft and corruption, nepotism and favoritism to a point of having completely shattered the common people's respect for the government. It is the classic case of a handful of people owning most of the wealth. The cities were dens of iniquity, crime and arrogant decadence. If the people had respected and supported the government and had possessed a strong sense of nationalism, the Cameroons could never have succeeded in conquering the country so easily because the guerrillas were never very great in numbers. Initially, many of the people welcomed the victors, but the awful truth of what they, the Khmer Rouge had in store for them wasn't long in coming. After the Khmer Rouge had succeeded in murdering two or three million people, the Vietnamese invaded the country and stopped the massacre. But after a few years, the Viets decided to withdraw and by doing so have left the way open for the Khmer to return. In relating the methods of the Khmer and the Viets to mass mind control, it should be clearly pointed out that most compliance to the occupations by the mass of the people was due to their fear of the guns of the occupiers and thus cannot be considered true mass mind control. Even lifelong orientation within a certain political or religious structure is no guarantee that the individual will not at some time rebel and challenge the ethics of the central authority. It may be noted that in every recorded society down through history, there always arose a segment of that society which chose to attempt and in some cases succeed to change the original direction of that society. So in this sense, the ideal form of mass mind control has never existed. Then there are examples of attempted mass mind control on the microscopic level. Case in point, the Jim Jones suicide incident and the Charles Manson cult murders. It is no doubt that both Jim Jones and Manson possessed a certain measure of that intangible factor that we call charismatic persuasion. Manson was able to impose his will upon his cult group through the use of isolation from society, drugs, sex and fear, and his own presence and philosophy. By using these methods over a period of time, he was able to weed out the rebellious and potential usurpers and keep these psychologically docile. Even so, he still never reached the ideal state of mass mind control over his disciples, nor did Jim Jones achieve that level, even though he may have come a bit closer than Manson. It may be noted that during the latter part of Jim Jones' infamous leadership, fear had become the strongest element of his control over his isolated cult group. 
When a scientist thinks of mass mind control, he thinks not in terms of religious, political, or ideological concept, but in terms of some man-made chemical, electronic, or other invention or process, which would be capable of transforming the masses into mindless, servile automatons. If such a creation should ever be perfected by mankind, it would, of course, immediately be bought, stolen or seized by the ruling factions, and forthwith abused to the extreme. I have no doubt that there are presently any number of secret experiments going on in universities, chemical companies, laboratories, and secret government installations throughout the world with this end in mind. Barring mind control, the ruling forces have resorted to and are still perpetrating ongoing schemes to weaken certain segments of societies or countries, and many of these schemes involve the coolest and most hideous forms of demonic subterfuge. Back in the 1950s, some doctors in Alabama, under government instruction, infected 20 black men with the syphilis germ and then observed them over a period of 20 years as the infection drove them insane or blind or both before they died in a most terrible fashion. They started the experiment in Alabama for a simple reason, that the chances of any of these southern black men ever having sexual relations with a woman of the Caucasian race was nil, so they were fairly confident that the infection would stay within the black community. This filthy, indecent, and ungodly experiment is atypical of the kind of leadership mentality that governs this land. The same experiment in New York or Los Angeles would not have remained so racially controlled. You may rest assured, the syphilis experiment was not the first nor the last to be sponsored by the government and other shady organizations. During the course of our conversations, I spoke to Tan about the acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. And even though he didn't elaborate extensively upon the virus, he did tell me that the disease is man-made. It is the product of biological genetic research of some Western medical personnel in Central West Africa. It seems that there is a certain species of monkey native to that area which transmits a certain kind of virus through its bite that when it interacts with the sickle cell trait, which is a biological anomaly possessed exclusively by the black race, it metamorphed into the HIV-3 or AIDS virus. Now, even at this stage in the African metabolism, the virus may cause the carrier some physical complications, but it's not generally lethal. Because the species of monkey in question is one that has been used as a pet and in other domestic capacities by the indigenous people, the simian carried infection is widespread in that area. The Western researchers knew of the virus and its unique properties for some time before its surfacing in the West. They started a research program on the virus with the ultimate goal in mind of concentrating and enhancing the elements of that virus which would make it lethal. They were hoping to tailor its lethal components so that the virus would be deadly to the black race only. They were eventually successful in culturing a more viral and deadly form of the virus. They then injected it back into the veins of a controlled group of local people, and as hoped, the virus proceeded to break down their immune systems and kill them. However, at this point, they hadn't tried the deadly virus on any other racial group but the pure blood Africans. Now they wanted to find another group of blacks whose genetic metabolisms were predominantly Negroid and in which the interracial sexual activity was a bare minimum. After some discussion and geographical research, it was decided that the small island of Haiti would be the best prospect for trying the AIDS virus. Why Haiti? Well, for one thing, Haiti is almost entirely black and the people of Haiti, because of their long isolation from the genetic pool mixing with other races, still maintain more of a pure African genetic metabolism than any other black group which was separated from the motherland. I have no way of knowing if these researchers took into consideration the fact that Haiti has been the unpublicized mecca and retreat for American and European homosexuals for years. 
or maybe they did consider this and chose to sacrifice, if necessary, a number of the Western homosexual community for the sake of science. After all, theoretically, the gay community is a relatively closed one, and this would be an ideal chance to study the transmission factor and the biological effects of the virus as it crossed the racial line, and without incurring the wrath of the straight community should the experiment ever become known. For years, middle, upper middle, and wealthy white gay men regularly vacation in Haiti because in the dirt poor, corrupt, and desperate economy of that country, an American dollar goes a long way and young black males can be hired inexpensively as sexual partners. Soon, the AIDS virus started spreading in the West. It was first thought to be an anomaly that was restricted to the gay community. The researchers who brought the virus to Haiti had not reckoned with the adaptability of the virus. It proved to be lethal to humans of all racial origins and is virile enough to be transmitted in a number of ways. The virus just happened to hit the Western Hemisphere when the use of intravenous taken drugs is at its peak among all strata of society. Before they caught and started to run tests on the blood bank cells by the drug abusers, a substantial number of blood recipients had been infected. Then there is the bisexual and the prostitution factor. This man-made virus may be the ultimate scourge to have been experienced by the human species since its beginnings. This awesome virus has the comedian-like ability to literally adapt its structural components to combat any known form of drug yet thrown at it. And in a sexually open atmosphere of Western societies, the AIDS virus is at this point one of the most deadly dangers to Western human population. But let's not get sidetracked too far from the subject of this chapter, which is mass mind control. I spoke of the AIDS virus and how it came to be among us, not as an example of mind control per se, but to make clear the fact that man will do absolutely anything, no matter how filthy, inhuman, or dangerous, in his quest to satisfy his wish to control the masses or to eliminate certain segments of the masses. Getting back to the elusive but much sought after method of mass mind control, let me turn your attention to the past mass participation undertaking, which in its inner ramifications yet remains unique and is born of a morbid ghastliness and universal measure of the true worth of humanity, which is untranscended by any other man-made monstrosity since the beginning of time. I am speaking of the Holocaust, the systematic and concerted effort to exterminate the Jewish race in its entirety by Hitler's Germany between 1933 and 1945, within the species family called human. It is universally accepted that self-defense, even unto murder, is permissible when it comes down to self-preservation. And from what I've learned of the aliens, the same sentiments holds true through the intelligent universe. Self perpetuity must be protected even at the cost of the destruction of an enemy. Thus the noblest principles of peace known to physical organisms is reason instead of harm, harm instead of maim, maim instead of kill, and kill instead of die. If a greater philosophy exists, then it is thus far unrealized in a practicable sense by any known intelligence. In any war, there are excesses to be expected, generally from all sides of the conflict. But these excesses are usually isolated actions by a given group of combatants in their quest to revenge some factual or perceived atrocity upon themselves, which was perpetrated by the opposing side. But to set about the task of deliberately and completely wiping out an entire chronogenesis race and seed of a non-combatant racial element even at the cost of continental and possibly world conquest. But to set about the task of deliberately and completely wiping out an entire chronogenesis race and seed of a non-combatant racial element, even at the cost of continental and possibly world conquest, it defies all the rudiments of reason, logic, and sanity. Such a concept in practice completely nullifies any possible claim a human society can make towards 
over animal separation and by proxy condemns all the rest of us for our inactions and mute acceptance after knowledge of the fact. In any major military conflict, it is inevitable that a substantial number of civilians will swell the casualty list of the conflict. The common symptoms of total war, of course, will cause much suffering within the civilian populace through the diminishing of natural and agricultural resources, rationing, overburden medical facilities, destruction of utility and sanitation service, and actual physical harm and death from deliberate bombing and terroristic actions. During the Second World War, the civilian populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were deliberately singled out for destruction by the U.S. military government. These monstrous atrocities cannot be ethically justified, however, as terrible as these actions were. From a militarily strategic and logistic standpoint, these actions made sense. By dropping the atomic bombs on these two cities, the American government was sending a clear and unmistakable message to the far-flung Japanese military, which in essence said, either give up the struggle or the homeland for which you fight will no longer exist upon your return. Without a doubt, even if the war had continued via conventional strategic means, tens of thousands more soldiers on both sides would have perished and the conflict would have dragged on for another year or more as the Japanese were entrenched on dozens of islands in the South Pacific. So even though the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were reprehensible acts, they were not difficult to comprehend from a strategic standpoint. No such strategic or logistical rationalization can be applied nor sanely comprehended when viewed in the case of the mass extermination of the Jews by Hitler's Germany. No matter the rabid extent of Hitler's personal hatred for the Jews, he could not have implemented his monstrous master plan of mass extermination without the actual aid or at least tactical approval of the German masses and the apathetic sentiments of the rest of the Western world. After the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, all of the Japanese people in mainland America were interned in military camps for the duration of the war. Now, while this action may have been premature and unfair on the part of the American government, it was not without understandable merit and practicality and not even the sometimes atrocious treatment of American prisoners of war at the hands of the Japanese caused the American government to commit similar atrocities against the interned American Japanese populace. Comparatively speaking, such actions of retaliation on the part of the Americans could have been justified in evil logic. The Germans could not produce any real justification for their beastliness against the Jewish population of Europe, quite the contrary by utilizing the economical, cultural, and scientific attributes of the Jews in Germany, Hitler could have aided his war effort immensely. In fact, the brain power of the Jewish scientists in physics and atomic research may have given Hitler the crucial factor he needed to emerge victorious in the struggle for world power because a great percentage of the Jews considered themselves Germans first and Jews second. No, in the Germany of pre-World War II, something far more fanatic, base, and demon-like pervaded the inner natures of an entire race of humanity, the likes of which has heretofore not been known or experienced among the human species. It was a thing unique unto a time and a race of man, and the alien tan and I discussed it rather extensively. Yes, the extraterrestrials seem to have more than just a fleeting interest in that wartime period, or more precisely, the years between 1933 and 1945, which I understand encompasses the initial ascension and the fall of Adolf Hitler. In order to more fully comprehend the factors which contributed to the Germans' national mentality immediately after the First World War, the political and economical agreements which resulted from the Treaty of Versailles did not leave Germany much room for self-determination and economical prosperity. 
After that war and before the rise of Hitler, the average German citizen lived in an economically depressed society. And under the Versailles Treaty, the prospect of future permanent wars for the average person a distant dream. Thus, the atmosphere was ripe for political change. And the fast rising young National Socialists or Nazis proved to be the catalyst for that political and social movement. Anti Semitism, of course, did not originate with the Germans or even in Europe. This racial hatred of the Jews by various peoples goes back to pre Christian biblical time. And as a general rule, some form of racial hatred is always reserved for people whose social and religious lifestyles set them apart from the general populaces among whom they abide. Such a phenomena is not restricted just to the Jews. We have only to look at Northern Ireland and the perpetual hatred between the Protestants and the Catholics, or the various factions of the Islamic faith in Lebanon and other parts of the Middle East. It is a case of brother against brother. Religious intolerance, it seems, has always been with us. From the earliest times of recorded history, we find that racial and religious persecution played a part in the sociological shaping of the times. From the ancient Babylonians to the Romans to the 10th century Christian Crusaders, we know that the Jewish communities of various places were the victims of pogroms and other forms of persecution. In Nero's Rome, as in several other places, when times were economically tough or when certain powerful people found it politically expedient, there was little hesitation in blaming the Jews for these misfortunes and then sacrificing them as a scapegoat pacifier to the angry public. However, when the initial bloodlust of the mobs was satiated after a short period of violence and looting, things generally settled back to normal. Sometimes the programs resulted in the expulsion of whole parts of the Jewish communities in certain places. Further, we find that in the case of all of these racial persecutions, there were exceptions to the rule. For instance, in Christian countries, those Jews who publicly turned away from their original faith in favor of the prominent religion of the region were spared, as were many of those who converted at Sword Point. In other words, it was generally the religion alone and not the physical origins that dictated the treatment of the persecuted. Before the Holocaust of mid 20th century Germany, there was never before recorded a massive, well orchestrated plan or movement on a national scale to literally commit mass genocide upon the Jewish race. Generally, we find that beneath the religious persecution there lay an ulterior motive having to do more with money than with ideology. The ignorant masses may have been driven more by racial hatred than by greed, but the church and political leaders were almost certainly motivated by the prospect of confiscating Jewish property and businesses. Once this was accomplished, they were content to call off the dogs and even be a little more compassionate towards the remaining Jews. Hitler's persecution of the Jews was unique in the sense that the possession of any Jewish blood was tantamount to a death sentence for those people unfortunate enough to fall into the hands of the Gestapo. Of course, the usual ulterior motives were involved in the murder of the Jews. You see, during the years between the First and Second World Wars, the segment of German society who seemed to be more economically fortunate in spite of the Depression was the Jews. To be sure, a core elite of the Jewish people had long held prominent positions in the arts and humanities, jewelers, banking, money lending, and industrial production. They wore expensive clothes, drove big cars, ate the best of foods, and maintained great cultural institutions and synagogues. Of course, as with the German populace, many Jews were poor, but even the poor Jews tended to place great emphasis on education and personal hygiene, thus exuding an air of prosperity even when it wasn't so. In the eyes of the average German citizen, the Jews were not proportionately wealthy in the face of a universal depression. So envious and hateful sentiments ran deep and raw in the hearts of the average German citizen. Many were deeply indebted to Jewish bankers and moneylenders, and many others were envious and jealous because they could not gain acceptance into the Jewish inner social circles. 
For the most part, the Jewish community maintained a social and economical system which was separate and apart from the larger German populace, and wealthy Jews were just as discriminating, if not more so, than were wealthy Germans against their children marrying out of their religion. So when the Nazis arose and started to blame the Jews for all of the social and economic ills, the general populace was quite willing to accept the Jews as a scapegoat and an outlet for their pent-up frustrations. During the civil rights marches of the 1960s, we may safely say that the rights of blacks were advanced because of the public outrage at the brutal treatment of those nonviolent marches. Yet, when far greater atrocities were publicly committed against the Jews in pre-war Germany, there were no such public outcry or popular support for those innocent people. Instead, the average German either participated in or stood back and gloated over the plight of his Jewish neighbors. As I've said before, the great crime of man is indifference to the plight of his fellow man. And this aberration of character seems to be an anomaly which deeply infects the European mentality, most notably the Germanic people. The same aberration is also dormant in the sights of the Croatians, Lithuanians, Poles, White Russians, English, and Americans to an equal or lesser degree. Because for the most part, those nationals in the German occupied territory were willing participants in the genocide of the Jewish citizens, while those in countries not occupied by the Germans knew of the atrocities and refused to work towards saving those people or even in broadcasting the facts to the public. The aliens are well aware of this fact and have given extensive study to this particular psychological anomaly among the white races. The aliens have a sociological research breakdown on all countries, races, tribes, and ethnic persuasions of humanity, and they have a comparative chart of models concerning things like matricide, patricide, incest, pedophilia, mass murder, both homo and heterosexual, child molestations, ritual murders, serial killings, suicides, and other depravities such as fetishes, sadomasochism, etc. And the Europeans win hands down in all categories of these negative aspects. The main focus, however, is on the German because the proven expression of their dormant nature forms a tangible base from which to build relevant data. It is a fact that as a race, the Jewish people have been the one most widely dispersed race of people historically on the earth and were therefore always available when a racial or political scapegoat was needed in a given place at a given time. While other races have been cast into the role of servitude or slavery, they rarely gained enough economical prominence to be perceived as a social or political threat as did the Jews. Having always been an educated and professional group, politically and economically, the Jews, no matter what their habitat, generally gained more notable political prominence and were thus more likely to be singled out for persecution. I am told that as a young, starving artist, Hitler was denied admittance to several institutions of higher artistic learning by Jewish administrators, and that he was denied the courtship of a young, well-to-do Jewess because of her family's disapproval of his poverty and religion. This, the aliens believe, was part of the cause of Hitler's rabid anti-Semitism in latter years. Yet, no matter how strong Hitler's personal hatred for the Jews was, he could never have succeeded in putting together his mad genocide machine without the physical, logistical, and sentimental support of the masses. Did Hitler possess the personal magnetism to actually have brought about mass mind control? The answer is yes and no. Yes, he did possess a great measure of personal magnetism and the ability to impose his will temporarily upon the most educated and rational of men. But no, neither Hitler nor his extensive propaganda machine could have persuaded literally tens of thousands of common people and soldiers to personally participate in the mass torture and murder of millions of non-combatants. Thus the conclusion that this bloodlust is an intrinsic factor in the German psychological makeup. In other words, the natural predisposition to murder without justification, reason, is a primordial possession of the German people and possibly mankind in general. The answer to that question could, to a great extent, influence the perception of the true worth of the human species as a whole. 
The great bulk of information which has emerged from the Holocaust has dealt primarily with the transportation and ultimate murder of the Jews. But there are other aspects of that infamous undertaking which have not been given much exposure. These aspects encompass everything from homosexual slavery to pedophilia, sadosexuality, lesbianism, sacrificial murders, genetic experimentation, human-animal transplants, cannibalism, rape murders, sadosensual torture, and any known kind of deviant fetish. Fetishes and other deviations could suddenly be legally practiced upon an entire race of people at will by any German male or female without fear of repercussions. Suddenly you could have your own basement or attic or secret room full of male, female, and children sexual slaves who were forced to bend to your every perversion under the threat of death. How many handsome young boys and men met their deaths while being chained in the basements of some middle-aged Fraulein or burger? How many thousands of beautiful young Jewesses were held as starving sex slaves to some elderly German farmer or babies sacrificed in satanic cult rites? Perhaps this sadosexual syndrome did not even dawn upon the minds of the conscious minds of many of the average Christian Germans. Yet, as time passed, the element of greed emerged. Why not loot the empty houses to get rid of the man who holds the mortgage on my house? Once having taken the plunge into larceny, many began to formulate plans for satiating their sexual fantasies. When all Jews became hunted beings akin to game animals under the law, it was a simple matter for a German citizen to go out and round up a number of the desired sexual human objects by promising help in one form or another. So the public at large became a direct part of the mass cover-up conspiracy. Just about everybody profited either directly or second-hand or third-handed from the properties confiscated from the Jewish people. We are all now partially aware of the genetic experiments performed upon the Jewish children by the infamous Dr. Mengele. But we were not told of the many houses of sexual slavery that were set up by the Nazis to service the military and civilian party elite, male and female, are of the carnal houses or camps that were maintained near the death ovens to service the camp guards and other soldiers. The much used inmates of these camps and houses were subjected to every kind of sexual deviation imaginable, including animals, and were completely expendable. This mass sexual preoccupation only served to strengthen the mass murder conspiracy. It is a fact that the women's camps were staffed mostly with the most sadistic lesbians, while the other camps were staffed with the most sadistic males, those mentally twisted people who gained sexual gratification through torture and murder. So then, when considering all of the mental factors involved in the Holocaust, patriotism, idealism, religious zeal, greed, and all other motivations, they all take a back seat to the sexual perversion factor. Yet, when it comes to true mass mind control, the actions of pre-World War II Germany are not a valid example of mass mind control. Upon close consideration, we must come back to the agreement that true mass mind control would consist of literally controlling the physical actions of people against their will while rendering them incapable of consciously rebelling against that control. Fear, greed, nationalism, and hatred, or even sexual license are not enough to accomplish mass mind control, nor has science yet created a chemical or organic compound capable of controlling and directing the masses in some coherent manner. Of course, they could put a barrel of LSD in the New York City water supply, but all they would get from that would be a million uncontrollable maniacs, or perhaps sedate the city and put everyone to sleep, but to what constructive end? Earth scientists have taken rudimentary steps in seeking to comprehend and utilize the beta wave factor in relation to the functions of the human brain. It has been learned that the brain's electromagnetic functions can be interfered with or momentarily short-circuited by directly bombarding the test subject with beta waves. However, the ability of the scientists to actually control the motions and thought processes of the subject via remote means is not even close to being accomplished. Technically, according to the aliens, the scientists are on the right track concerning mind control. However, 
man does not yet possess the technology to master this technique. At this point, Earth scientists have been able to accomplish some small things using beta waves. For instance, they have learned to induce anger or sadness temporarily by bombarding a certain person with rays. And conceivably, it might be possible to influence the mood of a crowd of people temporarily, but this could not be considered a viable or permanent form of mass mind control. Nonetheless, the quest for the perfect form of mass control continues. One of the greatest fears of the human race is that some hostile extraterrestrial species will use their advanced technology to take control of the minds of humanity. The most horrible fate that man can imagine is that of becoming a slave to some other human or thing. Yet the thought of enslaving others causes pleasant sensations in the hearts of much of humanity. There are certain segments of the European race who would rather die than give up their roles as slave masters, as is exemplified by the present racial structure in South Africa, and as was the case in America prior to the Civil War in the 1860s. After the Second World War, a large number of ex-Nazis and fleeing German nationals took refuge in the country of South Africa, as well as other locations like Argentina, Brazil, and some anti-Semitic Middle Eastern nations. It may also be noted that an even larger number of ex-Nazis found refuge in the United States, either with forged credentials or with the complicity of the American government. So. The same blood lineage and ideological concepts still very much pervade these societies. The aliens know that Hitler still exists in the hearts and intentions of his disciples, and South Africa is the Mecca which holds the seed of all that is beastly, inhuman, and perverse in European man. It seems that there is something in the nature of the European male and female, Slavic and Aryan. That causes them to literally swoon with pleasure at uh, the thought of holding the power of life and death and sexual deviant dominance over other human beings. So the same blood lineage and ideological concepts still very much pervade these societies. The aliens know that Hitler still exists in the hearts and intentions of his disciples. And South Africa is the mecca which holds the seed of all that is beastly, inhuman, and perverse in European man. It seems that there is something in the nature of the European male and female, Slavic and Aryan, that causes them to literally swoon with pleasure at uh, the thought of holding the power of life and death and sexual deviant dominance over other human beings. The South African, European, and American races would choose war and death over the probability of having to do that which is right and fair. The toxicians have argued, and with much justification, that the European race is expendable by virtue of its history and proven inner motivations, and that the elimination of this genetic strain might prevent the imminent destruction of the ecology and life chromosome of the planet. I differ with them by pointing out certain selfless examples down through the ages, and I further pointed out that during the civil rights marches in the 60s, a substantial number of people of European extraction also put their lives on the line for the cause. I spoke about the abolitionists and the conductors of the Underground Railroad before the Civil War, who aided slaves in their escape to the North. I spoke of the probability. That enough of a percentage of these people still exist in the United States and Europe to prevent the domination of Nazi-like elements from gaining control ever again. Therefore, I refuse to accept the opinion of the Targs in relationship to this race of man. Yet, my sentiments will not prevent this ruling segment of humanity from destroying the ecosystem of this planet. Nor will my opinion cause the South African Europeans to release a slave-owning stranglehold on my brothers and sisters. These are the people who tortured, starved, gassed, raped, and murdered six million non-combatant Jews, and who took great relish. And tossing truckloads of children alive into great bonfires, and who might very well commit the same atrocities again if given the opportunity. 
The question is, are they prevented from doing so by ideological enlightenment or because the Jews now have guns? I ascertain whether his scientists have the technological power to enslave humanity on the planetary scale, and this is basically the answer he gave me from the standpoint of military force. The answer to that question is yes. The ever-present factor of the fear of punishment and death can be used successfully in forcing the masses to do your bidding in as much as you are capable of enforcing the threat. The criminal, the antisocial person on earth is held in check by such means. However, these elements can persuade only those who fear the possibility of getting caught more than giving way to these compulsions. The law is not strong or fearful or efficient enough to dissuade the determined felon or the wealthy from their dastardly deeds. The astute but violent felon believes that he can avoid getting caught, and the wealthy believe with much justification that they can either buy or outwit the justice system. So no pure or equal form of social mass control exists in civilized society. However, the aliens, should they be so inclined, could conquer and control humanity via military might and police action because they have the true technology to do so. It is estimated that they would have to nullify at least a hundred million humans worldwide and completely eliminate all leadership in order to accomplish the proper state of physical futility, docility, and fear among the humans then it would be a matter of releasing a certain number of sentinel globes and laser bolts to keep the tabs on the activities of the charges, as well as to eliminate any infractors. Population control, agriculture, property dispersal, etc. could be governed in the same manner. Too many people zap. Actually, there would be many positive aspects and benefits for human under alien rule such as the unlimited non-pollutant power supplies via fusion technology. Though tens of millions of people now living would have to be put to sleep to prevent the further spread of existing contagious diseases, the ones remaining would live relatively free of disease because a healthy animal is a happy animal and the medical ability of the aliens are unbelievable. The average human lifespan would be lengthened, perhaps triple fold. Hunger and the homeless would disappear because of population control, agri-science, and the aliens' ability to reasonably control the weather. Marriage as we know it would no longer exist, and sexual activity totally unrestricted because the aliens believe that a sexually satisfied animal is a happy animal. Accidental maiming and physical handicaps would diminish almost to zero because all transportation would be centrally controlled and advanced bionics and implants would replace missing limbs, partial paralysis, etc. According to the aliens, the Homo sapien is biologically a vegetarian, therefore meat-eating would cease. All kinds of drugs or their organically degradable equivalent would be free and abundant to all who wanted them. All children of a given community would become common property of that community, and so would all resources. A monetary system would no longer be necessary as all essentials would be supplied. Education would be restructured to fit the psychological capabilities of the individual suited, so schools as an institution would no longer be necessary. Natural resources worldwide would be controlled and distributed equally as needed to everyone. Although each person would be granted complete control of their living quarters or homes, no one would actually own anything exclusively. In other words, the concept of rich and poor would no longer exist. Among other humans, an individual would be measured solely by his character and not by race or position. Religion as we now practice it would no longer be necessary. The research and contemplation of the elements of light would be sufficient for all humans. Continued violence between a certain male and female or homosexual couple would result in the nullification of both parties. The same holds true of any excessively violent person. Manual labor as we practice it would diminish almost to zero and leisure time would abound because nearly all of the work would be performed by smart alien design and program machines. For those who decide that life is not worth living, euthanasia booths would be strategically positioned around the world. When life under alien control is compared with life as it exists now for most peoples, 
It looks better and better, yet just beneath the surface of that carefree existence would always lurk the realization that one's destiny is not one's own and that death remains an ever-present reality. A great number would go about literally seething with inner hatred of their masters and benefactors. What kind of world would it be if no man had the power to force his will violently upon others and could not kill without dying? Or if no person could command fidelity of a mate through intimidation but only through love? If the formerly rich had to cook their own food and do their own laundry, I believe that I could easily live with such a system as described by Tan. However, that system, while being possible and efficient, still cannot be considered a true system of mass mind control. The people would comply with the ruling edicts of the aliens only because they fear being zapped into carbon dust if they didn't. I'm speaking of how I perceive that human existence would be under the guidance and control of the Beavians, but I shudder to think of what human existence would be come under the rule of the Targs or the Screed. Fortunately, and because of the power of the Beavians, man will not be faced with either scenario. Instead, the emphasis should be based upon the question, do the aliens have the power to subjugate humanity via mass mind control? Let us explore this aspect to a greater degree. There have been numerous visual sightings of UFOs by multiple witnesses who sometimes number in the hundreds. On many of these occasions, we find that many of the witnesses due uh, to the same incident have visual interpretations which are different in dimensions from the next witness to the same anomaly. People may get differing conceptions of the shapes, sizes, colors, distances of the ship, one person may see the occupants of the ship as being tall and blonde, while another may see them as being short and large-headed, etc., and then a few may not remember seeing anything at all. This leads me to believe that the aliens have been experimenting for quite some time with mass mind control techniques. Of course, there is the quite common occurrence of near-total amnesia and missing time in abductee subjects. Yet we know that these attempts at mind-wiping are not always successful. I am personally a good example of this fact. The alien computers are far more advanced than our own, however, a computer is still a computer and is restricted in its functions by precise laws of mathematical and geometrical logic. The superintelligent Biavian and Stagian scientists are not soothsayers and are thus restricted by their inability to deal with the illogical and not even their computers are as complex as the common human brain. Speculation on the stock market and in the cosmos is still a matter of chance. The best that the stockbroker or alien scientist can do is to use all available data on a given subject to narrow their odds, yet the unknown quotient and the element of chance remain. While experimenting on lower forms of life like fish and insects, the aliens have found that mass motivation control is quite possible. For instance, a certain wave frequency can stop an ant migration or start it. Heard a school of fish in a certain direction or cause whales to beach themselves for no good reason. However, when it comes to human beings, the process is not nearly so focused or simple. The same vibration or frequency which causes one person to experience great sadness may cause another to experience joy. The aliens have learned that all species of the lower life forms of Earth are rigidly bound by certain lifelong habits and motivations. All lower species of creatures, and indeed some humans, are creatures of unvarying habit. But the greater percentage of human beings are psychologically free agents, and to the aliens this presents a perplexing dilemma when it comes to the factor of mass mind control. The alien study of the prevailing mentality of the German populace historically is an attempt on their part to unravel this mystery because that particular populace has come closer than any other given ethnic group to possessing a common motivation. The fact that the catalyst of that motivation was born of a kind of sadosexual negativism is not as important as the fact that it transpired without notable variance. Hitler instinctively knew the right buttons to punch to bring about this. The same or a similar spontaneous syndrome happened in 1801 on the Isle of Haiti and during the French Revolution. 
something similar is taking shape in Poland, Red China, and several other locations worldwide. Still, none has yet come close to reaching the purity in force as did the German populace between 1933 and 1945. The second and closest example to Nazi Germany is the ruling factions of the Republic of South Africa. It is at present the only place on the planet where evil hatred and sadism have been exalted to spiritual dimensions. In order to maintain and inwardly justify such a system of bestiality, it becomes essential that one learns to literally love the role of slave master and find sensual stimulation in sadism throughout recorded time. No one but those of the German European extraction has accomplished this and institutionalized this state of human psychosis. This is not to say that none among them possess any decent benevolent human qualities because there are few voices of dissent among them. However, these voices of dissent are relegated to an insignificant quotient by the greater prevailing attitude. No doubt, a great portion of those ruling South Africans would voice the opinion that their racial position is predominantly economics. They simply don't want to share the wealth, but in reality, the true motivation far exceeds even the love of money. The fact that 99% of the Southern whites before the Civil War were poor did not prevent them from fighting and dying in order to keep the black man in human bondage, and the same hold true of the South Africans. The same blacks they hate were the same people who raised their children, who raised them and their forefathers. These are the same blacks who nurtured them in their sickness, served them faithfully during their times of poverty, and loved them even when their own brothers turned their backs on them, and yet they relished the power to maim, torture, kill, and enslave them. They would feel the same, even if all the gold and the diamonds were to disappear at this moment. The abiding love of and the wish to hold absolute power of life and death over another human being is a thing seemingly typical of the German-European race, and is thus an abiding interest to the aliens. If the force of that particular mentality could be harnessed, dissected, altered, and focused, it may be possible to find a common denominator in the human mass mind control factor. Is this syndrome atypical of the white race in its entirety? or has the sociological influence of other ethnic groups brought about a decisive fragmentation of this syndrome among them. The aliens are not interested in exalting one ethnic or racial group above another, just in finding a common psychological denominator as it applies to the masses of the people. Fortunately or unfortunately, they have not yet managed to do so. It seems that the variables in humans' psychological motivations present a viable method of inducing mass mind control. As I have stated before, I do not believe that the aliens have any wish to enslave humanity via military or mass mind control means. However, I know for a fact that the aliens are going to be compelled by necessity to reveal themselves in mass within the next 20 years, and I'm sure that they would much prefer that all of humanity welcome their coming instead of being afflicted with mass hysteria. They would much prefer that the military of the planet refrain from trying to shoot them down like an invading force instead of receiving them as the potential friends they are. On the other hand, they don't want to have to deal with great mobs of people who have not been chosen for the journey. Of course, as things stand now, none of these negative things could be prevented short of military means of mob control. No doubt it would be necessary to destroy some in order to protect the lives of the chosen ones and to assure that they made it unharmed to the pickup point. Dematerialization or zapping up a few abductees is a lot different from unloading tens of thousands at the same time. They don't have the means of the time to zap them up one by one or two at a time and go through individual decontamination. It would require too many small craft and present too many radar targets for military actions. The time factor involved would be extended from a few days to a few months, during which time a growing potential mob of human subjects would have to be fed, pacified, and otherwise dealt with, according to Tan. Any physical harm to humans or military damage to property must be avoided at all costs. Thus, the current preoccupation with exploring the possibilities of mass temporary psychological pacification. 
both for the children, earthly wayfarers, and for the population at large, but I don't think they have thus far had much success. So in answer to the question, do the aliens have the power, either mentally or technology, to mass control the minds and actions of humanity? The answer is no, they don't. And it is mostly due to the individual, fickle and indecisive natures of the human animal, and this indecisive nature is more pronounced in Earth female than in Earth male. In essence, how can the computer anticipate the actions of creatures who themselves don't know what their next actions will be? Plus, there is another even more important factor possessed by the erratic human species. In dealing with the Targs one-on-one and doing my telepathic experiences with Tan, I accidentally learned that a human is capable of telepathically barging into the mind frequency of the aliens and doing them telepathic damage. No, it is not the military or even the physical might of the humans that the aliens fear, but the psychological power. They are not mentally equipped to deal with the human emotions of pain, fear, and dementia. The potentially destructive force of thousands of humans together is astronomical and much too dangerous to be let loose among the alien populace. This potential for telepathic destruction is probably why most abductees are rendered unconscious of their immediate surroundings during the abduction. Because of my childhood innocence and my inner wish to make friends instead of cause harm, I was allowed knowledge of things which have been denied to most earth mortals since the beginning of time. It is extremely difficult for a human to gain such confidences once they have truly learned the nature of good and evil. This is why even the nicest people upon reaching the planet B.R.V. simply cannot be allowed free access to the general populace. For you see, while you are able to telepathically harm and destroy them, they cannot easily do the same to you. I suspect that this is why the Targs are so adamant against developing close socialization with the human species and why they have sought to intimidate or scare me out of revealing this truth. They have tried the power of their mind on a human, namely me, and they have failed miserably. Of course, not all people are as mentally dexterous or as fearless as myself in this manner, but neither are all aliens as mentally strong as the one they sent after me. So now you know why the aliens could never telepathically control the human species on the mass level. The alien's study of and preoccupation with the mentality of the pre-World War Germans and white South Africans and others gives me cause for contemplation. If all of that collective hatred and bestiality could be harnessed and then focused, it could conceivably be utilized by one alien faction or race to telepathically disrupt, incapacitate, or even destroy portions of some other alien enemy. In fact, telepathic destruction could conceivably be the ultimate universal weapon. Could this be another reason why the Targs don't want large populace of human beings on the planet B.R.V.? The Targs probably know that they could never persuade a large number of human beings to assist them in such a manner, so they don't want the obvious to have the potentially dangerous advantage. Since I came to this conclusion on my own, it never occurred to me to put such a question to Tan. When I stop to think about it, it begins to make more sense. I am aware of the fact that the Biavians have perfected a true Star Wars umbrella protection system. It would be literally impossible for an enemy to penetrate this system and destroy BRV via high-tech conventional means, such as fictional projectors, particle beams, lasers, masers, antimatter rockets, or remote or manned warships. So the method of attack would have to be some process which could penetrate all known protection systems and do enough immediate damage to prevent retaliation. Theoretically, a mentally destructive force could be fashioned, focused, and utilized without registering on the high-tech protective sensors, and Earth humans could be the ideal material to form the power telepathic nucleus of that death beam. Let me caution the reader that this scenario is one of my own creation and is not due to any information or speculation to the effect from the aliens. Two, the aliens are great students of human psychology, and they have carried out ongoing genetic experiments of the human species. But I do not believe and haven't been given any reason to assume that the aliens have any conspiracy afoot to destroy or enslave humanity. If they are going to have to deal with humans on a mass scale in the near future, then 
it is essential that they learn as much about the human animal as possible. And even though they have tried to hold the psychological impact upon their human subjects to a minimum, it is still unfortunate that they don't seem to have realized the magnitude of the pain and suffering they have caused many of the abductees. I have tried to impress this fact upon them, and I believe that the Biavians at least have truly learned from my input. Some people believe that the aliens have cut a deal with the government to trade technology for genetic material, but this is not true. Yes, the government and the military powers of the world are well aware of the aliens' existence and presence, but they have never been able to develop any tangible communications with them. Think about it. And you can easily realize that the aliens do not need or require the permission of the government or military to carry out these experiments. I have written aboard a Biavian whispercraft, a saucer, on more than one occasion. So I know firsthand what these craft are capable of, and I have been shown on the vid screen a portion of the awesome destructive military potential of these beings. No, they have no wish to conquer or otherwise subjugate man. I do not question the sincerity of most environmentalists who seek to save the ecology and certain animal species of this planet, nor do I question the wish of these aliens to save the human race from self-extinction. Update 2007 Chapter 11 Mass Mind Control Truth or Fiction We have discussed many aspects of the theoretical application of mass mind control techniques. When it comes to cognizant beings with individual personalities, no one set technique can work on the universal scale. Yet, this does not dissuade your politicians, conglomerates, advertisements, religious figures, and pharmaceutical entities from continuing to try. Today, societies are constantly inundated by various forms of open and subconscious persuasions. The result has been uh, that erstwhile good people uh, putting their lively and precocious children on personality-suppressing drugs, which may result in a future Columbine incident on the child's part. Instead of proper diet, moderation, and exercise, many people are buying magic pills, which promise to make them thin again, almost overnight. Such a thing does not yet exist on this planet. The examples of such wishful thinking and methods of deceptive subterfuge are too numerous to mention. The truth problems of the world, the false wars, the famines, the destruction uh, through adverse weather changes, the rampant thievery of the health care system, the oil companies, the insurance and pharmaceutical consortiums, all seem to take the back seat to the current news of some Hollywood diva showing up with no panties on. When we hear that another five young soldiers have been killed today, most of us don't give it a second thought. It is as if we have been afflicted with the kind of saturation apathy. This is a kind of media condition, if not engineered, uh, mind control over the masses. I must ask myself, how would I feel if my son or daughter were killed to satisfy some hidden or greed agenda of a heartless conglomerate? and sycophant politicians. Then I can imagine what the families of those young soldiers feel. Down through history, whole groups of conquered people have been held for a time in abject slavery. Uh, through the use of terror, the truncheon and sword, yet mass mind control has never been universally accomplished. The seed of rebellion was never extinguished. It has been shown time and time again that the best uh, advancements and social peace was gained and maintained when the ruling factions gave the common citizens a chance to participate in the dream. At this point in time, in this country and many others, 
one-tenth of one percent of the population controls two-thirds of all the resources of those countries. I submit to you that such a situation is a formula for chaos and destruction. All of the great technological advancements of today will come to naught if the societies of the planet remains in chaos. It is past time for people of the world to advance to a higher level of consciousness and cooperation, lest mass destruction befall us all. All greatness in humankind begins with the wish and desire to seek to bring about that greatness. Let it begin with you. And like a great oak from a single acorn, it will grow. Never give sway to hopelessness. Stick to your ethical guns and things will change. We cannot just sit about and trust that our so-called leaders will voluntarily bring about these changes. We should not sit idle, and our prerogative should be to use our votes, letters of persuasion, creativity uh, to bring about these peaceful changes upon the earth. This will bring about the diminishing of the greenhouse global warming effect that may soon destroy life as we know it upon the face of the earth, but people we must participate on all levels. The aliens began teaching of these accumulated effects of atmosphere's destruction even when I was a child, even though these effects were not so obviously prominent back then. Since all other info they have given me has been dead on, I am inclined to believe them. Mother Earth is in a lot of trouble. Enterprising politician and aspiring would-be dictators have found that the best mode of mass mind persuasion or control is to play upon the innate prejudices of the people. Nero blamed the Christians for all of Rome's ills. Hitler blamed the Jews for Germany's economic misfortunes. Before the Second World War, the Japanese were taught that the Chinese and other Pacific Rim people were less than human. American soldiers were told that the Japanese were little more than animals and so on. During times of depression or war, the preconceived prejudices of the people can be played upon and utilized as a method of mass mind control. This same catalyst is being used even unto this day in various forms throughout the world. Racial, ethnic, uh, and religious intolerance uh, is very much alive today, and millions are still being murdered because of it. One would think that in the world of today, with its advanced technologies intertwined economies and mass communications, that a semblance of universal reason would by now have been accomplished. Quite the contrary. Instead of reason, the whole world has gone apeshit. All indi indications point to the conclusion that we are living in, in more perilous probabilities than ever before in the history of the earth. The aliens saw it coming 53 years ago and told me of these coming days. If I did not truly understand then, I definitely understand now. Yet, our destruction is not written in stone, people. Thus, I have come to warn you of these things and also to tell you that we can change this probable destiny. Do not let your politicians and preachers think for you. Scrutinize, question, and think for yourselves. Only in this way do we stand a chance at a livable future. End of chapter 11.